Josh Pask, professional footballer, CEO. Welcome to the Beyond Football Podcast. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you for having me, bro. It's a pleasure to be on. Yeah. I always like to begin with, how did your football journey start? Was it always a dream for you? Oh, how did my football journey start, man? This I could give you the long answer or the short answer. But um, the longer answer is it started pff, as early as I can remember playing football just... As you do, my dad introduced me to football. He was, uh, you know, he used to play back in the day just for his local side in um, somewhere in Cornwall. Um, but obviously he introduced me to the game. I went to play Sunday league football as early as I'm five, six years old. Um, and yeah, just as you do, as most kids do at that age, just enjoying it and just scoring goals, playing, running around. Um, and yeah, that's how it started. It started at Wanstead Flats uh, near to where I was where I grew up in East London. Um, like I said, just playing for a Sunday league side. And yeah, I remember this one day. Um, I me- remember it quite vividly, actually. Uh, we were finishing up from a Sunday league match. I think I was about seven at the time. And I remember driving down the road. If anyone knows one step flats, it's quite a narrow road and it's it, you can go both ways. Um, now, on the other side of the road, uh, was a car and there was just no way to sort of go around the car so we were kind of stuck um, you know trying to get out of this situation basically so my dad gets out of the car and the woman that's in the other car gets out of the car it turns out they know each other um, and that woman was Marcus Brown's mum Julie Brown wow. right um, and they just got chatting reconnecting because they knew each other from church yeah. um, and she kind of just told my dad oh it's good to see you sort of thing been a long time my son's playing football he's on trial a few clubs at Charlton West Ham my dad was there saying oh it's interesting um you know my son's trying to get into football um and then she said oh yeah you know if he's any good I'll get one of the scouts to come and watch him play and that's how it kind of happened um and I remember a few clubs were interested to come and watch me play at uh, once flats there and that's how my football career started uh back on once the flats oh God knows, a long, long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago, now nah, it's been so. It's been a, it's been a journey indeed. Well, I've been oh, going into the academy system at a young age. A lot of people, that's like a lot of parents is that's what they want their child to do. How was that experience once you actually got into the academy system? Yeah, yeah, it's a interesting one. Um, my parents were very encouraging. So my dad was very encouraging, obviously Christian man and my mom was a Christian woman. So very encouraging, never put much pressure on me. Uh, I always in- felt like I enjoyed my football and they definitely didn't put much pressure on me. Now, you know, both me and you are in a football environment. We know what it's like growing up in, in the academy and parents putting a lot of pressure on their kids. And I really felt that not how ha- w- there was already enough pressure as it is. I mean, you're in a West in academy at West Ham, mm. you know that you want to keep progressing as you go up through the age groups. People aren't getting kept on, uh, so you know that there's an element of you know not everyone's going to make it. People are getting released, and yeah, I mean, it was really good to have parents that really encouraged me and just helped me enjoy the game, um, and, and that was a positive thing. I think it's really important, especially you know if your parents and you, you want your kids to sort of play football just make them enjoy it just really encourage them don't put too much pressure on them you know the, the likelihood of you know a young kid making it in the professional level is extremely low not to say that you know your kid or my kid can't do it but it is just trying to make them enjoy it. i think that's the only way that they're going to really progress you know up the age groups in the academy and then go on to you know play one day um professional football somewhere uh, but I really enjoyed my football when I was young. My dad didn't put much pressure on me. Yeah. And yeah, I think that was that's what definitely helped me get to where I am today. Yeah. That's really great to hear. I feel like in, in the academy system, especially back in the day, there's a focus on focusing only on your football. But you said you didn't really you you enjoyed it. I was wondering what other interests did you have alongside your football when you were coming through the academy system? Because yeah. yeah. Correct me though. You ca- you joined the academy system around the age of before the age of eight. Yeah, it was around like I think it's the first age group that there is. I think it's eights. I, yeah, I believe yeah. um, maybe some academies are sevens, but it was eights. But yeah, it was just sport, man. Yeah, like bro, like 
basketball, football, cricket. Yeah. My dad introduced me to a lot of these sports, track and field. So yeah, just playing a lot of sports and enjoying running around. I think I had that gene, I guess. My dad was quite athletic. My mum, Jamaican woman, <laughs> quite athletic <laughs> again. So I just had it in me to just run around and, mm. you know, be out playing one sport or another. Um, so yeah, just had an interest in sport at the time. Not, nothing else. Uh, was quite active in school, like PE and after school clubs as well. So just, you know, if it wasn't at West Ham, it was at the time I remember being at sort of Spurs, uh, Arsenal, just doing trials there. Um, other days I'll be playing cricket or football, uh, sorry, or basketball or golf. So just very active. Um, and that's what I enjoyed at the time. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. When you when we speak about players and their experiences in the academy system, there's there's a whole range of different opportunities and insights. How did how did you find your your scholarship and going from transition from scholarship to being a pro and how you spent your time during those periods? Yeah, I remember it being quite tough. Um, I remember a few. I think it was around fourteen, fifteen. I got offered this pre scholar. Uh, kind of the, the club incentivizing you to stay on knowing that there's probably other clubs out there mm. you know trying to get your contract uh, trying to get your signature but um, yeah they offered me a pre-scholar so I kind of had that in the bank so you kind of knew that coming out of school you had something there uh, probably didn't help kind of slapped off my GCSEs oh, wow. um, didn't really focus I remember not even turning up sometimes um, at the time, we I think we were one of the first age groups to do the, the football school. So where, obviously, you, you were part of the academy, but you also did your school at the same time. Yeah, yeah. It was like, we were like the guinea pigs, the experiment uh, age group. But I don't think it worked, in my opinion. I think, looking back at it, there was a lot of times I just, I remember missing the first class and just going straight into training. Like, and literally just doing that, just missing the first class. And obviously, those have been vital lessons that, you know, you need to be a part of to really make sure you get a good GCSE result. Mm. That's, I remember not turning up because sometimes you were training with the first team as well back then. And it's like, you know what? Uh, I'll just make sure that I prioritize this. Yeah. So it probably didn't help. Um, but then, yeah, obviously knowing that I would get a scholarship, um, knowing that obviously some money will start coming in. Uh, but I remember the days being very long. I remember, you know, going, going in sometimes, finishing really late, and as a scholar, you're doing everything, aren't you? You're cleaning boots, you're, you're training twice uh, a day, sometimes a lot of gym work. Yeah. Uh, I remember it being quite hard. And I remember a lot of guys struggling um, at the time. But uh, nevertheless, it was an experience and it kind of made me aware and got my eyes open to sort of the working world and what it really means to sort of earn a living mm. um, and, and work a full-time job. Yeah. Oh, it's really it's really interesting to hear like the... <laughs> Obviously GCSEs and slacking them off and but what took me through what a week would look like when you that because you said the you guys were the guinea pigs so yeah. it didn't really work. What did that week look like for you guys? Yeah, I'm not too sure if they still do that kind mm. of thing. I'm I'm sure they do, but I remember maybe on a sort of obviously Monday to Friday you're going to school. I remember it being th maybe three lessons a day and two training sessions. So it was coming sort of at 8.30, do your first lesson, whatever that might be, and then you're into training. So you get prepped for training, go out and train. You'd finish that, have lunch. After lunch, you'll go into two lessons, I believe it was. Um, and, you know, thinking about it, you've already done one lesson, you've worked, you know, really hard on the training field. You, you really can't be bothered for the next two lessons. So you kind of slacked it off. Um, after that, we had another training session and then we had gym after that. And, when we were, you know, year 11 at the time, year 10, year 11 at the time, the scholars would do their gym before we would. So we would have to wait until they finished their gym session to go in the gym. So sometimes we're getting in the gym at like five, six o'clock, you know, after a long day of yeah. um, school and training, you know, you're finishing your day. I remember leaving sometimes really late at like, you know, eight, nine o'clock, getting home for 10, which is crazy. Wow. You know what I mean? For a, a school kid. Um, so yeah, that's why I just think it was just too much, you know, a lot of pressure. You're in that environment the whole time as well. You're just like, it's football and, and school all in one. Yeah, it, you know, at that age, you need to kind of 
have some time away from the game, enjoy time with your friends. You really need to get the opportunity to do that. Mm. Even during sort of the summer holidays, there weren't rich, really much of a summer holiday because you were in pre-season. So I remember it being quite tough just because it was everything crammed into, you know, gym, training, school, crammed into a, a long day when, you know, before that usually you would train, oh, sorry, you would go to school and then come back home go to training, come back. Mm. So it kind of split up. So I remember it being quite tough, man. Um, okay. So I don't know, I don't know what's going on now. I don't know if they're still kind of doing <laughs> that, but at the time it was, it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. But do you think those experiences shaped your, the trajectory of your, your career that like moving forward helped you when you progressed in the pro game? <sighs> That's a good question. You know, I don't know if I'm honest, I can't, I don't think I can answer that. Mm. I just don't know. I, I Honestly, man, the amount of guys, that get let go at that age. I think that's the, you know, the biggest drop off rate around the age of sixteen, uh, eighteen, sort of sixteen to twenty one. That yeah, age group. Yeah. I remember, you know, the guys that I was with, at sort of the football school. You know, maybe only three of us play now. Me, Ben Sheaf, Marcus Brown, or Grady, Grady Dean Garner. Other than that, that's it. You know yeah. what I mean? So, and there was, you know, fifteen of us. So, I don't know, man, if I'm honest with you. I, I, I don't have really fond memories of, of that time. It's just a lot of work and a lot of stress, mm. um, trying to sort of prove yourself to get, you know, a professional contract um, to really progress. Yeah, whether it shapes me, I, I don't know. I, you know, it definitely brought resilience yeah. to a certain degree. Um, but then again, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of those guys really grafted and put the work in and really tried to get that, you know, scholarship. And they just didn't. Um, maybe they weren't good enough. Maybe they were. They weren't favoured. But yeah, I, I don't know if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah. Wow. that's a it's an eye opening eye opening question. But all those experiences shaped you into obviously have that resilience and go on to sign for other clubs and go on and develop a, a purpose and identity away from the game. Could you talk me through how that experience came about yeah so i remember um age 21 it was my final year at west ham and up until this point you gotta remember i was there from eight to 21 so a long time you know over a decade of being at one club never been rejected now i've seen so many guys come and go mm. so many guys you know be, be there for some sometimes years and then all of a sudden they don't make it to the next age group uh, or they don't get a scholarship, they don't, they don't get a professional contract. And I see just a lot of boys just drop off. At this point, I've kind of, you know, worked up my way up every single level. I kind of had a feeling that in my last year, I wouldn't be getting a new deal. But I remember, it's so, so ironic, April Fool's Day is when they tell you, uh, the 1st of <laughs> April is when they tell you whether you're going to get a, a new contract or not. It's crazy. But um, I remember getting told, you know, I wasn't getting kept on. And it was the first time I, I had rejection. Mm. Um and I cried. I, I was devastated. I remember leaving that room and going off and just crying. I, I was on the phone to my dad and I felt really felt like I let him down because obviously he helped me. He brought me to football up all those years. He really put time, uh, effort, sacrifice for me to really make it to the professional level at West Ham. And I didn't reach there. I was getting told I was getting let go. And, you know, it was it was hard pill to swallow at the time. Um. And it was the first taste of rejection I've really ever had because I've always been accepted. I've always been kept on. I've always mm. been given a contract. And it definitely affected me that day. I remember later that day, I ended up, for whatever reason, going to the local Tesco, picking up a bottle of vodka and wow. down in that and ended up in hospital the next day, which is crazy. Wow. Um, and at the time, I remember saying, oh, it wasn't because I you know, it was let go. Clearly it was. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't deal with it, I guess, at the time. In that moment, I felt, you know, I let my dad down and my family. And yeah, that's just, uh, that's just the reality, you know, that's how I felt. And yeah, I mean, it, I guess in a sense, you know, throughout life, you're going to face rejection. People are not going to want you or like you or want to keep you on in whatever that looks like, whether that's your career, relationships, whatever that might be. But it was my first taste of it. Um, the good thing is, obviously, I grew up in a Christian background, a Christian household, and, you know, I was at church regularly, had people around me to support me. Um, my girlfriend at the time, she was very supportive. Um, so was my, obviously, my parents and my close friends as well. So 
as much as it was a rejection, um, I knew that it wasn't the be all end all. Mm. I knew that, you know, I'll potentially be able to find another club somewhere. You know, God has a purpose for me anyway, whether that's in the game of football or doing something else. So, yeah, at the moment, it wasn't nice, obviously, yeah. facing rejections for the first time, not knowing how to deal with it, ending up in hospital the next day. But, yeah, it, it didn't phase me too much. I managed to find a new club, managed to move on. And uh, I think what helped me was I had a few loan moves when I was at West Ham um, that really sort of gave me some first-team experience and obviously helped me get a, a move uh, at the time to Coventry. Uh, so, yeah, it was a eye-opening experience for sure I don't really share that story much but you know it's the reality you know mm. people go through reje rejection people get let go and sometimes it can really take a toll on you yeah and you you touched on on faith not no, thank you for opening up ultimately I appreciate the the openness but I really wanted to dive deeper into your faith and how that's influenced your football career and who you are today yeah man oh Inside your football. Yeah, I mean, where would I be without my faith and my belief? Um, where do I start? I think, obviously, growing up was I had a I had a background in Christianity. I had a background in going to church, in ethics, in in morals, and understanding who God is. I was baptized very young. I understood what I was doing at the time as well. I understood that Jesus died for my sins. Um, I understood that Jesus loved me. I understood that I had a purpose through him uh but yeah man it's just given me a different perspective i guess you know my identity is not in football you know it's it goes far beyond football you know kicking a ball around on a, on a field for 90 minutes is you know there's more to life than that for sure and sometimes you can be so fixated and so engrossed in in football in your occupation in your profession and when something gets taken away from you it's like what do I do now? Who am I? Um, I certainly felt like that sometimes when I was injured. You know, you're out on in the physio bed, in the gym, you're looking out on the pitch and you're like, am I even a football player? But you know that in Christ, your identity is not in football, but it's in Christ and he gives you your identity. Amen. So, yeah, man, it's, I mean, having that, I guess it's that perspective, bro. I think I look at so many football players and I've had conversations with a lot of ex-teammates at West Ham who now long, no longer play the game. And they're really struggling to get out of the identity crisis that they're in, wow. being ho holding on to, I'm a football player, and that being taken away from them. Mm. And if you think about it, you know, a lot of these guys, they played from eight all the way until 21, 23. And they, all they know is football. All they know is kicking the ball about. All they know is the, the status and, and the notoriety of being a professional football player. But, when that gets taken away, who are you? Mm. When that's stripped back, yeah, you know, who are you? Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, thankfully, I think obviously being brought up in a Christian household, I've definitely had that ground in that foundation. I am a child of God. That's who I am first and foremost. Everything peeled back. I have my identity and it's rooted in Jesus Christ, something that will never change. Uh, no one can tell me uh, no or you're not that anymore or... Um, He's not rejected me. I know who I am. And yeah, you can say what I want. You can tell me I'm a bad football player. You can tell me that um, I'm not good enough to play at West Ham. You can tell me I'm not good enough to play at Coventry in the Championship. You can tell me whatever, but I know who I am in Christ. And I think having that perspective shift, not a lot of football players can say that, unfortunately. Um, and, and just knowing God's got me, regardless of what people might say, regardless of what my professional occupation might be, I'm a child of God first and foremost. And yeah, it's, it goes back to that perspective shift. If you have that perspective, if you understand who you are in Christ, you know, nothing can phase you, man. Amen. And from these experiences, it sounds like you, you gained that level head through your faith and through these rejections and bouncing back stronger. Where did, or how did the idea of past removals come about and bringing it to reality and doing something alongside your football? Yeah, a great question, man. Um, this is what I'm passionate about. Uh, it was the fact that I moved to Coventry after I'd been let go from West Ham. Obviously, I was in London at the time and I needed to relocate and move up to the Midlands. So I had a few bits of furniture, some clothes and stuff, and I needed a van to help me move pretty much. 
So I thought to myself, okay, I knew one of my cousins at the time who worked for a local sort of moving company and I just gave him a call. I said, you know, you able to help me out sort of thing? And he said, yeah, sure. Um, and gave me the contact details to the owner of the company. He managed to give me a good discount on the move. I, I, it was only 400 quid. And yeah, one evening, um, I came back down to London after training, packed up my stuff, loaded it into the van with a guy, headed up to Coventry and helped him offload. Uh, it took over about two and a half hours, um, including obviously the drive as well. And I thought to myself, wow, that wasn't too bad for him. You know, he got mm -hmm. in 300 quid for two hours worth of work. <laughs> it's not bad going. And he wasn't, the, the owner wasn't the guy that did the move. It was one of these sort of um, workers. So I thought to myself, oh, interesting. Just had it in the back of my mind. Never did anything with it. Obviously, I just moved clubs. I wanted to focus on my football. Um, fresh start. Unfortunately, uh, I had a great preseason. Unfortunately, just before the start of the season, I fell down on my ankle uh, and ruptured a few ligaments in my ankle. And unfortunately, had to have surgery to sort of reconstruct the ligaments back together. In that time, obviously, I had some time off, time to you know recover from the injury and was kind of down, uh, down, upset about it, but kind of had this moving company idea in the back of my mind still, never really acted on it, just just in the back of my mind, thinking about other things, as you do when you're sort of away from the game at the time, just recovering from an operation. Came back, uh, was back on the pitch, really wanted to you know kick on now and perform. I was almost like a new sign-in because I hadn't played a game yet. Uh, made my debut, uh, was doing really well at the time, sort of get back out on the pitch. We'd, the, the club was doing great. We were top of the league at the time. And then all of a sudden, COVID striked. And uh, I thought to myself, okay, well, I mean, I got, went from being injured for half the season to coming back for about two months. And then the season curtailed and, you know, everyone's sitting at home. So I thought to myself, all right, well, I don't know what to do. I'm, you know, I go to football on a daily basis, but mm. that's been taken away from me. I'm sitting at home now yeah I mean I mean, what do I do what do I spend my time doing and that sort of thought came to the front of my mind oh yeah that guy started that moving company and you know he earned 300 pounds from helping me move oh, I can I can do the same thing um, I knew a couple of guys that were made redundant um, unfortunately got let go from their from their jobs because of COVID and competent individuals that I could trust that were reliable and I thought you know what if I purchased a van you know, these guys, these guys can do the work and, you know, we can earn quite a bit of money from doing that. And that was it. That's the mindset I had. I didn't know anything about business, nothing about <laughs> removals. I just thought if that guy could do it and earn 300 quid, I mean, why not me? So it was, that was where the idea sparked. Um, it was very much from a place of, well, how easy was it for the season just to end like that? And p loads of people to be made redundant, loads of people to be let go from their jobs. And, we were put on the furlough scheme so it was like wow like all of a sudden we're just in a lockdown and there's a massive virus going around you know how easy is it for that to strike and take someone's job so I thought you know what let me not have to rely on football my whole career let me try and do something on the side almost mm -hmm. uh, which can supplement maybe the income that I was getting from football but then also would outlast my football career that was the idea because uh, if you're going to start something, there's no point starting something that's not going to last very long. You know, you do things long term. And and that was, I was very much in the mindset of making something that will last longer than my football career. Even if my football career was to last extremely long, I still play football to this day. Um, you know, the cap is really 36. You don't really see many players make it past that. The average career is about eight years. So it's not going to last forever. And a lot of football players need to start thinking about, you know, what am I going to do after I help the boots. Mm. Um, so yeah, we just got started with one van. We, uh, you know, I had a budget of I think it was seven grand at the time. We purchased a van for four thousand seven hundred pounds. We got all the other miscellaneous bits, insurance, etc. Uh, you know, the initial budget was seven seven grand, and we just started from there. Just started as I knew how, advertising on social media, marketing um, on you know platforms like Instagram, Facebook. Twitter at the time and, and that was it I didn't know anything yeah. about business nothing about marketing nothing about sales yeah, I'd like to get into how initially you spoke about missing those lessons for your GCSEs yeah. DNA levels and that. how did you obviously not having the qualifications and everything what was it 
that allowed you to gain all the that information that those expertise in those areas you you went into business you went into digital marketing you went into i don't know logistics leadership these are all skills and qualities that people go to university but you managed to do it all by yourself how is that process like alongside playing football yeah i you know i think it's just initially it's i can do that so it's belief mm. Starting a business, you I know you don't have to have any qualification as long as you can provide a service for people. You know, people used to sell Lucas Aids outside of school, yeah. you know, for, for two pounds, you know, <laughs> buy it for one pound, set for two pound, you know. So I thought, well, I, I can clearly start a business. So awareness, belief that it would work. Mm. Um, I And I used what I got. I had men that were available that could do the work that were in need of work to earn a living yeah i mean yeah so belief awareness i knew that i had skills from football so hard work obviously leadership being a center back having to communicate and have conversations with people um i, I guess i had discernment as well and I, I think i got that from my faith and understanding what people are like being able to discern uh maybe someone who's genuine from someone who um is not so genuine so yeah just use what i got i, ha I had a bit of computer skills from i used to love playing call of duty back in the day i used to edit mm. call of duty videos and i used those editing skills to make content to post to advertise our service so yeah i literally used the expertise i had you know i didn't know anything about business i didn't know anything about vans but i knew that well people clearly need this service there's football players that are moving all the time every transfer window i know that other people are moving as well all around the country i knew it was in demand service i knew that I need to advertise my service, otherwise no one would know that we exist and we would never get any work. So I knew I had to post things f f for people to see. Mm. And I had men that could do the work and I had obviously a little bit of capital to spend on a van and that was it. That So I, I didn't really think, uh, I don't know enough. I just got started with what I had at the time. And no, I, guess, no. I, I guess a bit of ignorance. I, I was ignorant to the fact that, okay, well, um, was it going to like for parking where you're going to park these vans what equipment do you need uh, how do you load a van how do you you know make a sale how do you turn someone who's inquiring into a client yeah. i don't know any of that wow. but i just knew well someone needs this service there's people moving all the time i can buy a van i know that you know guys can do the job and that was it and that's how i started so yeah. no expertise but just a belief uh, and a willingness to make it work and it has up until this point yeah that is beautiful I, I wouldn't say that's ignorance, but well, I as you I, have to have a lot of courage to do that. And yeah, I, I'm, it's like what you said, belief as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm ignorance in a term, in a sense, I didn't know what I was doing. I was yeah. ignorant to the way the business works, to business in general and removals in general. Like I didn't know nothing about both of those, you know, fields. I don't know about sales and marketing, and I didn't know about loading a van, speaking to a client, offloading a vehicle, dismantling and reassembling furniture, packing up items i didn't know nothing about that the only experience i had was me moving but i didn't move much i just had a few bags and clothes and i didn't even have a mm. sofa you know what i'm trying to say so i just thought oh he can do it and it was pretty easy for him you know why can't i do it so that was it it was ignorance in that sense but yeah. it was definitely element of belief um and willingness to figure it out as we went along yeah it's nice it's great so that's a it's a real benchmark for other players who might be looking at, okay, cool, what can I do? Sometimes you might not know every single details, but once you just get started, you can actually learn who you are in practice. A hundred percent, bro. I, 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 I think for professional football players, you're starting to see it more. You're starting to see that, you know, Hector Bellerin, I, I'm sure he's got uh, some form of company, Eric Dyer, yeah. he's got that spotless app. Um, so there's other players that are doing it and, uh, you know, creating businesses and understanding their football career is not going to last forever. Um, even seen obviously like Cristiano Ronaldo, he's got his various brands and, and Messi and Michael Jordan, you know, people have been doing it, don't get me mm. wrong. But, you know, starting up a local service business and just, you know, you don't have to have a, a massive name or a brand already to start a business. You can, you know, no one really knew who I was, um, but I managed to start something from scratch something that I didn't know much about. And it's more than possible for other players to do the same thing. Now, players have the capital, number one, to get something started. And they also have 
most of them have a bit of a following, a bit of a, a brand, if you would like, already. So there's already two things that players, a lot of players do have to use to their benefit to start a business. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, what else are you going to do with the money? You're going to spend it on, what, clothing that goes out of fashion, you know, every new season or new cars that, you know, there's a new model every few years or, you know, going clubbing and drinking or gambling. You know, what are you going to spend the money on? Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, there's not a lot better to spend your money than buying some sort of asset, investing in yourself, investing in a business that's going to last way longer than your football career does. And if I'm honest with you, you're going to probably pay you a lot better than your football career does over a longer time horizon. Um, so I am I believe that you're going to see a, a lot more football players do you know, a very similar thing in the future. I think awareness of it, obviously being sharing things on social media, not just myself, but a lot of these other players, um, and just revealing to people what is actually possible. Mm. You know, people might say, well, Josh, how are you, how are you able to do it? You, um, you know, you play football full time. Well, you have your evenings, you have your afternoons. You know, when you make it to the first team, you know, you're usually finishing around two o'clock latest. You get home for free, let's say, and you've got free up until you go to bed at 10, 11 o'clock to really focus on building something for the future. Um, so just about utilizing your time and educating yourself. I use my time going into training every day to educate myself. I listen to audiobooks, podcasts, coaching calls just to increase my knowledge and my awareness of what's out there and the opportunities. And that definitely helps. So just utilizing your time, man, and having the uh the willingness to actually spend time to focus on building something for the future mm. and i believe that you'll see a lot of football players do exact that uh in the near future man no i definitely i definitely agree and the processes that people go through to help you get to that level seeing people like you do it that's what what's going to allow them to to know that it's possible so that's why i'm so grateful for this but i wanted to gain a little insight into your experiences now and how you actually do it. You currently play and you're CEO of a business. Yeah, man, it is difficult getting off the ground for sure. Um, I mean, the amount of businesses that start up, that fail within the first five years, I think it's 70, 80%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's obviously hard. It requires a lot of getting punched in the face and figuring it out and not knowing what to do and making mistakes and learning from the mistakes. Um, so in the first few years, obviously we're only three years in, so we're brand new. But I remember the first year, actually the first two years being very hard, um, having to learn patience, having to learn how to deal with different individuals because obviously we're bringing more people into the team and how to manage different personality types. Yeah. Um, the fact that I'm nowhere near where the business is based as well. Obviously we're based in London and I live in a completely different city. So trust, having to build trust and build that systems and processes and getting feedback from the guys and iterating things. Uh, it can be very difficult, especially if you don't know what you're doing because we're literally growing it and we're like, we don't know what the future looks like. We don't know how to grow your company. We're just figuring it out as we go along. Mm. So it, it was very difficult in the first two years. Now it's a lot easier. We have, you know, full-time employees. We have virtual assistants. We obviously know a lot more. Um, so we're able to delegate and have systems run the business. So now I can focus my efforts on marketing, which is a lot easier than dealing with clients, dealing with uh uh, the workers dealing with employees dealing with uh, logistics i don't have to deal with any of that anymore so we were able to sort of delegate that to to the guys um but in order to get to that point where you can delegate you need to sort of figure out yourself so the first two three you know two years were difficult um boy i remember sometimes when i had to after training head down to london to fix problems wow. to uh I remember this one specific job that we didn't have enough guys to do the work. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to jump on the job. So I remember coming down from training, jumping on a move, and not finishing until like 3 a.m. because wow. we didn't know how to reassemble a wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> and then traveling up, having training the next day, like next day, crazy wow. stuff. Um, obviously, putting out fires as well. Things go wrong, things break. Dealing with, you know, clients who are upset. Um, trying to navigate that. 
dealing with breakdowns on the motorway and the lads not knowing what to do and me having to figure it out, knowing I have a night game and the lads, it's like six o'clock and it's, you know, I'm trying to text and call people in the, in the toilets uh, whilst we've got a game, you know what I'm trying to say, preparing yeah. for, a, for a warm up. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety at times, a lot of not knowing what to do next. Uh, but that's what's required, man. Mm. You, you've got to do what's required at the end of the day. And if you really want to build a business or build anything, uh, for it to be long lasting and for you to turn over a profit and for it to make sense for you in the future, you're going to have to go through the tough times at the start. You know, getting off the ground is always the hardest w with anything. If you want to become a professional football player, first you need to learn how to kick a ball. You know, you go from looking at Cristiano Ronaldo scoring bicycle kicks and you don't even know how to kick a football mm. at, you know, five, six years old. It's going to be hard. You know, um, so yeah, that's just the reality, man. It's yeah. it's tough, but it gets to a point where you're able to put the systems, the processes in place, bring on quality individuals who can run the business. Uh, so I can focus my efforts on marketing, on sales, which are a lot less demanding, um, but higher leverage activities to really grow and scale the business. Yeah. And do you ever think that your business or being or running it has limited your football? That's a great way. question. You spoke about those. I can just picture that image of you, obviously, you're just having maybe your pre-match meal and you're just sneaking off to the toilet, dealing with business calls. Yeah, you know, I still do that now, man. Like, yeah. If I'm honest with you, I still do that now. It's more conversations and just, if the guys need my input, you know, I would send them a text. Um, it's getting to a point where they're just, fig they, can, they can sort it out themselves and they know what to do. But, has it affected my football? Probably. Probably. There, there's definitely some late nights that I've had, which has affected my training, potentially. Yeah, um, but it's also knowing yourself. If I'm honest with you, Dan, I probably, you know, I'm not good enough to play in the Premier League. Uh, and I probably knew that at a, at a young age. Um, you know, I played a few games in the Championship. Was I good enough to play at that level? Maybe. If I really was focused on perfecting my craft, was I intentional? about really making it as a professional football player and it being the be all end all no um so just knowing yourself as well man like knowing your level you know now i'm playing mm. the welsh league it's a lot less demanding and i decided to go there as opposed to going other to other english football clubs because i knew it would be less demanding and i can focus on this opportunity which i believe is a big opportunity for myself and my family for the future mm. so that's exactly why i took the opportunity to go to the Welsh League so yeah football was never a, the be Wendell um, I, I knew that you know it's an average eight year career 35, 36 you're finished um, could I maximise playing football I could have but I know myself I know that I, I like this I probably like it even more than playing football you know football can, can be stressful don't get me wrong um, so yeah I, I think to be honest, to answer your question, probably has affected my football career. But would I take that trade every day of the week? Mm. Every day of the week. Because I have something that will last a lot longer than my football career. And I, I tell you what, Dan, a lot of players are thinking, boy, I wish I was in his shoes. I wish I would have started a business. I wish I would have, mm. you know, had the mindset to, to create something for myself that's going to last longer than my football career. Because guess what happens? You start at academy, or, you know, at a Premier League club and you drop down and you drop down and you drop down and the money's not the same. You know, people think that football players make, you know, tens of thousands of pounds a week. Most footballers don't. Most footballers don't play in the Premier League. Most footballers are playing, you know, League One, League Two, National League football, lower than that. Lower than that and yeah. and the money is nowhere near what it's like <laughs> at the champ, uh, you know, playing the Prem. So maybe people get this wrong, per wrong perception of how much football players do make. Um, but yeah, like what we're turning over in the business far exceeds what I'm getting as a, as a football salary. Yeah. Um, it's just a better opportunity so yeah. I'll take that trade every day of the week no, I appreciate it. I appreciate the honesty do you think then this will be a situation that will happen more often in the future where players are less players are having football as their be all end all I, I think so I think the awareness mm. of there are other things you can do I think social media helps with that I think that you know you, you can see like I guess I'm an example of someone who's plays who plays the game. I still play professional level to this day full time. You know, we even play in the Champions League qualifiers 
uh, sort of during the preseason, um, you know, I still play. Uh, and, and I do this other thing as well. So I think the awareness that you can do both and you can utilize your time to play football and then focus on something else. You don't have to do something as demanding as removals. You know, there's a lot easier business models, um, you know, a lot just, you know, using your laptop. So, yes, I, I think that you're going to start to see players, like I said, do both. I think that players who are educated and spend time to get clued up and use the opportunity when they're traveling in to football or traveling to away games to learn about business, they're, they're going to have their eyes open to what's possible. And uh, I think that will definitely push players to a point where, okay, I need to do something else other than kicking a ball around. Um, just I just don't think the opportunity, especially playing in the lower divisions, is as uh, attractive as it may seem from the outside because you're just not earning the money that the Premier League players are making. Um, and certainly, you know, when I moved to Newport on loan, uh, I was at Coventry, I moved to Newport on loan. The lads there were just, a lot of them were either gambling or looking at some sort of crypto cu uh, currency or uh, looking at some sort of M NFT because they realised, well, hold on a minute, I need to the football money ain't great. I need to sort of supplement that by doing something else. So when you drop down the levels, I don't know what it's like for you, but I certainly feel like the, the lads are a little, a little bit more entrepreneurial. They're a little bit more, more savvy, mm. um, you know, outside of the game as much as, you know, they are still playing professional football. Yeah, definitely. I feel like you've touched on this question a little bit, but I want to ask it directly. Who are you beyond football? I'm a child of God. First and foremost, um, that's who I am. Strip everything back, strip professional football player, strip business owner, CEO, you know, all these titles that you get. Forget all that, man. I'm I'm a child of God and that's that's it. That's the only thing that matters. And we haven't really touched on it in a great deal about my faith and my belief and my purpose and um and the reason why I do everything is all for the glory of God. But, you know, football doesn't matter. You know, come on, man, it's mm. kicking the ball around. As much as, you know, removals is great and owning a business is fantastic and, and obviously providing a service for people, which is which is fulfilling, you know, that's, it's, it's not it's not as good as being saved and knowing who you are in Jesus Christ and having your identity, having no anxiety, no worry, no fear, no doubt in knowing I have my identity in Christ and no one can take that away from me. He loves me, he cares about me. Um, and it's greater than any title that man can give you or any uh, any little bit of fame or notoriety. Um, so know who I, who I am in Jesus Christ. That That's everything. Uh, and that's who I am. Amen. That's it. Well, you're standing on a firm foundation of faith. Um, you guys have heard it here. Thank you very much for coming on, Josh. I know we can go on and on. We're definitely going to bring you on for a part two. But... What's one thing you'd leave a younger Josh Pask, who's maybe that 15-year-old, just to finish off? Oh, good question, man. A young Josh Pask, 15 years old. Well, for context, if I was 15, I'd be year 10, year 11, um, playing at some sort of academy. <sighs> what, would, in, what information would I give that person? I'd definitely say, first and foremost, get, get in your word, man. You know, know, know who you are in Christ. I probably didn't know who I was in Christ as well as I do now back then. Um, because there's a, such an emphasis on trying to become a professional football player. Uh, but that's not the be Wendell. You know, there's more to life than kicking a ball around. I would definitely say focus on that. Read your Bible, pray, um, and and enjoy it, man. You've got to enjoy it, bro. If you don't enjoy it, you ain't, you ain't getting far. Mm. Uh, and I would definitely encourage myself at 15 or encourage a 15 year old who's in the academy to enjoy their football. Because if they do that, they're more likely to perform, have left pressure and, and progress and do do well. Uh, so that's what I would say to a young 15 year old Josh Pask. That's it. Nah, it's been it's been brilliant having you on Josh. This has been the Beyond Football Podcast. Thank you very much for jumping on Josh. I really appreciate it man. Thank you for having me on. No problem. Make sure you guys like, comment and subscribe. And if you guys got any questions for Josh, leave them in the comments below. And till next time, Beyond Football.